So when I was 13 years old, I told my mom that I wanted to knit a sweater, but first we had to get some sheep. And we had dairy goats, so this wasn't really that big of a stretch. So we did end up getting sheep. And she found someone to teach me how to knit, and I learned how to knit socks, and we got a spinning wheel, and we got sheep, and I started learning how to spin and how to weave and do all the fiber arts I could. And ever since then, I've really had this really deep love of all things wool and all things fiber arts. So um, about 10 years ago in April of 2011, I started my business, Spindle, Shuttle, and Needle, and it was online only at first. It was a yarn shop. I had boxes of product under my bed in my dorm room. And that fall, I finally opened my physical yarn store here in Stromsburg. And by the next spring, the idea had already started of maybe opening a wool mill. And at that point, I didn't know too much about what actually went into that. But I thought it sounded like just a fantastic idea. And about three, three and a half years ago, I decided that if I was going to do that, I needed to actually start doing the research for it and figuring out a business plan. And I worked with the Nebraska Business Development Center. And eventually, once I got my business plan done, I moved on to working with REAP for loan assistance and figuring out you know, how to get that into a bank and stuff. And now, well, here I am. I've got a wool mill. What, it, what intrigued you? about the wool mill because there isn't a lot in the area. There are not a lot in the area. Um, it, let's see, well, first of all, I had seen some different videos and things of equipment working and of equipment making yarn and making the other products and I thought that was really neat. Um, there was, at the beginning, a little bit of a misguided idea that um, oh, it's going to be just so much easier to cut out the middleman for the robings and things that I was selling in my shop. Um, not that that's completely misguided, but there's still, there's a lot more work that goes into it. But then also just the whole, I saw that there was a tremendous need in the market. There's, um, Nebraska I think is fifth in the nation for sheep production, and yet we do not have a custom wool mill until now. So everyone who has sheep and has their little flocks, like my mom's flock of 40, there's lots of flocks around that size because I think in the U.S. 90% um, of flocks of sheep are under 50. So those smaller flocks, people are bringing their wool out of state to be processed in mills in Iowa, South Dakota, or Kansas, or Colorado or else they're selling them to the wool pool for basically pennies and when you have a flock that small it that doesn't pay. So I'm hoping with this to expand the market for Nebraska wool and market it to the world. A fleece shows up, the very first thing we do is we spread it out on our skirting table even if they reassure us that it's been skirted. So we can check it over for if there's any weak spots or any really dirty spots that they missed in skirting or things like that. Um, if there is a weak spot or if there's something that's like, sometimes the neck might have been clean and they've left it but it's brittle or too short or shorter than the rest so it's not gonna make good yarn so we'll skirt that out. Um, sheep are always making more wool so it's kind of in our best interest to only process the best because then we'll get the best product. So we skirt that through and then once it's skirted, we weigh it again and then we take it over here to wash it at our washing station. And we have a very large bathtub and two sinks so we can do really large loads or small loads. And the water is actually 180 degrees. And we um, actually use Unicorn Power Scour um, wool wash when we're washing things. Um, that helps the hot water and the scouring detergent both help to lift the lanolin out of the fleece. This is actually an alpaca fleece that we're washing right now, so it does not have the lanolin. And then we spin things out and they go into the drying closet to dry. And that usually then is the end of what it's doing for the day because it usually takes until the next day to be completely dry. The next step then is um, we will weigh it again. So we can see if we've had a lot of waste to losing, you know, 
losing the lanolin and stuff, this is especially a thing with like merino sheep or other really greasy breeds. So after it's been washed, the next thing that's up in the order to be picked comes over here to the picker. And this actually um, teases the wool apart because you can see after it's been washed, it's kind of matted. Imagine if you washed your hair and dried it without combing it. So we have all these teeth in here that pick the wool apart and fluff it up. And, so turn, turn back up again. Yeah. and that big drum here, actually, this rotates to pick the wool and fluff it up. So that is, that is the next step. And after it's been picked, it, we say that it takes one tub of fleece and makes two because it just super fluffs it up. And the next step after that is the carter, which we have open for cleaning right now because it does need cleaning periodically. And um, that combs the wool. And our carter is, um, it was made in 1929 by Sacco Lowell. And um, it originally started life as a cotton carter, but it is, um, has been used as wool carter for at least the last 20 years, if not longer. And the first time it comes off of the carter, when we've sent a batch through, um, we send it onto the Batmobile, make bats. And then the second time that the wool comes through, we send it through onto, this is the roving attachment. So it comes out as a strip of roving, which is then ready for the pin drafter. And it's been combed quite a bit and it's organized, but it's not ready for the spinning frame at this point with the roving attachment. When it comes off of the carter, it looks like this. This is roving and it's rather thick actually. And it is not ready for the spinning frame yet. And the fibers, while they're combed, they're not perfectly aligned yet. So they feed through this machine this is a pin drafter. It was made by Warner and Swayze sometime in the 1940s, as far as I can tell. And the strips of roving go up and over and through, and they get combed and combined together and also drafted out so that they're thinner so that they are ready for the spinning frame. And this is where you adjust what we call our sliver or sliver weight, depending, different people have different pronunciations of the same word, um, which then determine, is a lot of what determines what size of yarn you are making on the spinning frame. So it comes out through here, we put a little canister down underneath and it coils it down into the canister. And from there, it comes over here to the spinning frame and the canisters of the sliver feed the, um, the sliver feeds up and over and through and underneath these rollers and through here and onto a spindle like this. And this spins at a prodigious amount of speed and this is what makes your yarn. And this is the noisiest machine in the building actually because not only does it have five separate motors to turn all of these things. It also has a dust collector as a vacuum attachment so that if your yarn breaks, your sliver just gets sucked into these little holes rather than spitting out and wrapping up in this and making a mess. It's quite ingenious. And after it's been spun, it comes over here to the plying frame where it, you can take multiple strands and ply them together to make your finished yarn. And after you are done with your finished yarn, it goes over there to the skein winder. And we wind it into skeins of yarn. <laughs>